Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's program by Tom Countryman, who is the chair of the Arms Control Association Board of Directors, and who will speak to us today on 13,000 Ways to Die, the Risk of Nuclear War Today. I am Megan Phillips, the co-director of ICFRC and host for today's program. We would like to take a moment to thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these programs possible. I especially want to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, the University of Iowa International Programs, UI Honors Program, UI Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. I also thank City Channel 4 for helping us make our programs available to online audiences. And today I would like to give a special shout out to Physicians for Social Responsibility who are co-sponsoring today's program. Our format today will be our usual. Following our speaker's presentation at about 1 p.m., we will have a 15-minute Q&A with questions submitted by audience members via the comments section in Zoom. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce Tom Countryman. Tom is the chair of the Arms Control Association Board of Directors of positions he has held since October 2017. Tom was the acting Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security he served for 35 years as a member of the U.S. Foreign Service until January 2017, achieving the rank of Minister Counselor, and was appointed in October 2016 to the position of Acting Under Secretary of State. He simultaneously served as Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Nonproliferation, a position he has held since September 2011. Today, he's going to speak to us today. She's going to speak to us on the dangers of nuclear warfare. So please join me in welcoming Tom Countryman. Thank you so much, Megan. It is a real pleasure to be here and to see so many interested people. I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in Iowa. It's been many years since I visited Iowa, uh, but I feel like I did the next best thing. Last night as I was flipping through channels, I came across a utterly awesome basketball team. And I think I will be an Iowa Hawkeyes fan for the rest of this season at least. It's good to see a couple of native Iowans I've known for many years, Ron McMullen and Tom Goodman on this call. So I know I'll get at least two hard questions. So let me uh, share some pictures with you as I talk. As you might guess, this is a terribly complex subject, uh, but it is not one that is beyond the comprehension and the action of ordinary citizens. And the way I'd like to start is by reminding folks that there's a big gap between ordinary weapons and nuclear weapons. We're all used to seeing pictures of wars in Iraq and Syria and bombs exploding. None of that would prepare you for the actual use of a nuclear weapon. It would be beyond the imagination. So this is in the picture, the largest non-nuclear bomb in the United States arsenal. Uh, it's the Massive Ordnance Air Blast Bomb, or the better acronym, the mother of all bombs. And it has the power of 11 tons of high explosive. It's been used once in 2017 against the Taliban in Afghanistan. Now, by contrast, some of you may remember in August of this year, there was a massive explosion of fertilizer stored at the port of Beirut in Lebanon that leveled a considerable part of that city. That was one of the largest non-nuclear man-made explosions in history. And it was roughly 50 to 90 times as powerful <clears throat> as the largest non-conventional weapon that the largest non-nuclear weapon that the US military possesses. Going up the scale, this is a schematic of what our military calls a low yield nuclear weapon. Low yield nuclear weapon is one of my favorite euphemisms right up there with alternative facts. Uh, this weapon possesses five kilotons, 5,000 tons uh, of explosive power. Uh, and so it is uh, about 500 times as powerful as the largest non-nuclear bomb. 
This is the very first atomic bomb ever used on Hiroshima in 1945 with a yield of 15 kilotons. So more than 1,000 times the largest non-nuclear bomb. And going up the scale, this is actually smaller than the Hiroshima bomb, but the explosive power of the standard weapon in the US nuclear arsenal today is 300 kilotons. Um, so 20 times as powerful as the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. The US and the Russian Federation each have more than a thousand weapons in this category and most of them are deployed, that is ready to be launched by one side against the other. So what does it mean for you in Iowa City? Let me recommend this website, outrider.org, as a very comprehensible guide to all issues about both nuclear weapons and climate change. <clears throat> you can simulate the effects of a nuclear weapon on any location you choose. So if a 300 kiloton weapon were dropped on the center of Iowa City, uh, this is, uh, I think you can see the size of the fireball of the radiation effect, the shock and the heat effect. And you can calculate the number of casualties uh, that would result from a single 300 kiloton warhead in Iowa City. Now, I don't know if the Russians have one of their more than 1,000 weapons of this size targeted on Iowa City. Uh, you should not feel honored or dishonored whether they do or they don't, but they certainly have uh, more than 1,000 weapons that are pre-programmed to hit American targets, as the US does for targets in both Russia and China. I focus on the United States and Russia because these two countries together possess more than 90% of the more than 13,000 nuclear warheads that still exist in the world. The actual number for Russia and the United States is higher than you see in this chart because both Russia and the U.S have about 2,000, more than 2,000 weapons each that are slated for retirement, that is dismantlement, no longer active. All the other nuclear weapon states that we're concerned with maintain much smaller arsenals than the US and Russia. We need to talk about nuclear weapons because it is the other existential threat climate change, we know a lot about what will happen to the planet if climate change continues without effective action. But the thing about nuclear weapons is that a nuclear war tomorrow could cl cause climate change at supersonic speed. Not only the direct effects of explosions, fires, and radiation, but a change in the climate that would be more extreme, immediate, and potentially longer lasting than those that we are doing through man-made manipulation of the atmosphere. So I say all this because I wanna frighten you. I don't wanna frighten you to the point of insomnia, but I do wanna frighten you to the point of caring enough to express an opinion to our leadership. In recognition of how catastrophic nuclear war would be since 1945, uh, the US and the Soviet Union, now Russia, have realized that we have to think differently about war than we did in the pre-nuclear age. And we've had some success. I'm sorry that some of the numbers are cut off on this slide, but what you see in the blue line is the number of US nuclear warheads, the red line, the number of Soviet or Russian nuclear warheads. We reached a mind boggling plateau of more than 30,000 nuclear warheads by the late 60s and Russia reached 40,000 by the mid 1980s. Since that time, we have each eliminated about 85% 
of our uh, previous peak number of warheads in the arsenal. So we've had some success by at least this important metric of reducing the risk of nuclear war. And how did we do that? Well, arms control has been a serious academic study and not just for academics, but for military and political leaders as well for 60 years now. And they, this, is, this slide shows you the central aspects of what we mean by arms control, that even with adversaries, even with potential enemies, we have a mutual interest in avoiding war in minimizing the costs and the risks of the arms competition and in curtailing the scope of a conflict should war occur. And that is the pursuit that successive leadership in Washington and Moscow uh, have gone after. As a consequence, this is a listing of the most important US-Soviet, US-Russian agreements reached since the Kennedy administration. And each of them made an important contribution to reducing not just the size and expense of our arsenals, but more importantly, in reducing the risk that they would ever be used against each other. We did that because from Democratic to Republican president, back to Democratic, the last 10 presidents before our current president agreed on certain core facts, that when we pursue arms control, we're not giving something away, rather we are enhancing <clears throat> the national security of both sides. It's not weakness to talk with an adversary. It's not necessary to solve every problem with an adversary before you solve this giant existential program. And each president has believed that the US has to show leadership in the world in coming up with the next important idea to reduce risks. That's what's led to success. One of the things that concerns me and that I think it's necessary to speak out now is that there has been an alternate narrative that has become more popular in American political discourse that contradicts pretty much all the bases of the philosophy that gave us some success in arms control. The idea that negotiating with weaker opponents makes us weaker, that since we are the strongest power, we should never constrain our own power, even if it means constraining threats posed by other countries that we have to solve all problems simultaneously. As with Iran, it's not enough to solve the nuclear problem, according to the Trump administration. The only good agreement solves every issue you have with an opponent at once. And perhaps most dangerous is a return to a mentality that first American thinkers and then Soviet thinkers began to give up in the 1960s and 70s. And that is thinking that you can have a nuclear war and that it can be limited and that it can be a victory for one side or the other. The recognition by President Reagan and President Gorbachev in their joint statement in the 1980s that nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought is slowly being lost in the political and military thinking in both Washington and Moscow. And there's a return to thinking about how nuclear weapons could be used on a limited scale to contribute to a victory in conflict. This, I think, is one of the most dangerous trends in both capitals. Now, as a consequence, we've already lost some of the treaties that defined an era of arms control. The crowning achievement of the Reagan administration was the INF Treaty between Reagan and Gorbachev that limited, in fact, eliminated an entire class of weapons, intermediate range missiles. Uh, the US has pulled out of this agreement last year after the Russian Federation had repeatedly cheated on the agreement 
and both sides seem kind of happy not to be bound anymore by that requirement. We've lost the Iran nuclear deal two years ago that constrained Iran so that it is now back on a path closer to a nuclear weapon than it was five years ago. And uh, I should have changed this slide because the Open Skies Treaty, which is not strictly a nuclear treaty, but one that allows countries in Europe, including Russia and the United States, to fly over each other's territory taking pictures as a confidence building measure. Two weeks ago, the US formally withdrew from this treaty. And the last important treaty between Washington and Moscow, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or New START, is due to expire on February 5th. Uh, if it is not renewed by Mr. Trump in the next 40 days, uh, President-elect Biden would have 15 days after taking office to do the necessary paperwork in order to extend this agreement for the next five years. And that, I am confident, will happen. If it fails to happen, we have big problems. Uh, let me not try to explain this slide, except to say that both the US and Russia are within the limits. That is, they are both complying with the limits set by the New START Treaty. And that's a different situation from the INF Treaty, where Russia was actively cheating on the treaty before the US withdrew. Now, all of these points together, to me, indicate that we are at the highest risk of a nuclear conflict since the end of the Cold War. And I'll go through some of these points in more detail. First, there are more potential flashpoints, more points where US or NATO and Russian forces are close to each other. And at a moment of tension, an incident, an accident could become an incident, could become a conflict, could become a nuclear conflict. We have more points of friction and fewer circuit breakers than we have had in the past. Secondly, both the US and Russia continue to attach importance to the so-called low yield or non-strategic nuclear warheads. And both of them are thinking more actively than in the past about how you would use these warheads in order to de-escalate a conventional conflict. That's not easily done, but the fact that both countries are thinking that it's possible to me, increases the risk that a low yield nuclear warhead could be used. There's the recurring problem of false alarms, and there's the questions about whether we have leaders that we trust. So just to cover these points in a little more detail, I recommend if, if you simply Google Plan A Princeton, you can see a very short video that would illustrate the first point, how a conventional conflict, maybe in Poland, maybe in Kaliningrad, maybe in Estonia or Latvia, could move from a limited conventional conflict between Russia and NATO forces towards a nuclear exchange and then an all-out nuclear exchange. As I said, the circuit breakers that would help to protect it are not currently in the best working order. <clears throat> on the question of false alarms, I want to encourage you, if you've got time to read just one book, please read this one, simply called The Button. The primary author is Bill Perry, who was the Secretary of Defense. We've never had a Secretary of Defense who knew more about nuclear weapons than Bill Perry. And he outlines the number of times that the US or Russia have come close to launching nuclear weapons in response to a false alarm caused by technical error or human error. And also describes why we are not yet past that risk and that danger. And he has very specific proposals about how we can further reduce that danger. Um, the false alarm stories are hair raising and if we have time, we'll go into some of them. Now, at 
this point, take a look at these nine faces and Megan, I can ask you to put up the little question for audience participation, if you're able to put that onto the screen. These are the nine men, and of course they are all men who currently control nuclear weapons, who have their fingers on the trigger of nuclear weapons. And without doing any very deep analysis, just kind of from your gut, I ask you, how many of these nine men do you trust to do the right thing in a military or a nuclear crisis? So let me pause for a moment while you uh, give you 30 seconds just to pick a number from zero to nine. And we'll look at those results at the end of the talk. Okay, thanks, Megan. We'll take it down and you can show us the results uh, at the end of the talk. It matters that each of these nine have virtually sole authority to launch nuclear weapons. And it matters that in the United States, the president has the legal authority to launch nuclear weapons only on his own word. There is no process, there is no requirement, there is nobody he needs to check with. All right, let's take down the poll, or should we take a quick look at it now? 11 people picked zero, nine picked one, four picked two, one extremely opti optimistic person picked eight out of nine. Uh, I think if you take the median you might share my concern about the reliability, stability, quality, whichever word you want to use, about the leaders that we have today, particularly as the world drifts in a more nationalist, populist direction, and whether we can count on them to do the right thing about nuclear weapons. So with all of these risks, what choices do we have as citizens? as the United States and as the world. And it can come down to either you continue to live with the risk or you begin to seek practical steps towards a world of reduced risk and ultimately towards a world without nuclear weapons. President Obama made an attempt in his first big foreign policy speech as president in 2009. He stated clearly that America would seek the security of a world without nuclear weapons. He acknowledged in the same speech how difficult that would be and that it may not be accomplished in his lifetime. But he at least set it as a goal more clearly than any other US president has done before. And I was proud to be a piece of the bureaucratic machinery that made some progress towards that goal. But today we still have some very practical steps that the new president, Mr. Biden, will have to deal with fairly immediately. One I've already described, a two week period in which to either extend the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty or let it expire. President Biden will also face a decision that he might make early or may wait about a concept called no first use. The idea is that the United States would say that we will not use nuclear weapons on anyone unless we are attacked with nuclear weapons. That is, they have no purpose other than to deter others from using nuclear weapons against it. It's not a no-brainer. It's a very hard decision, but it has some significant implications for risk reduction. The Congress needs to address the question of the president's sole authority to uh, decide on the use of nuclear weapons. Before Mr. Trump was elected, members of Congress had introduced a bill that would limit the president's power to uh, his sole discretion 
to launch nuclear weapons unless the U.S. were under nuclear attack. And I think that legislation is going to be debated again in the next couple of years. And finally, the new administration will face big questions about the modernization budget. Uh, can we afford to continue to spend $50 billion a year for the next 30 years and probably beyond on modernizing our nuclear arsenal? Or can we find ways to reduce that amount and to either direct it towards other means of enhancing our national security uh, or, for example, providing for domestic needs? These are the tough but very practical steps that I expect the new administration to take some direction, some action. The rest of the world is not waiting while the United States and Russia are stalled on any further negotiation about reductions. In 2017, 130 countries came together and negotiated a new treaty. Back in 1971, we negotiated a treaty that made all biological weapons illegal everywhere. In the 90s, we negotiated a treaty that declared all chemical weapons to be prohibited. Following that model, 130 countries negotiated this treaty. None of the nine states that possess, possess nuclear weapons participated in the negotiation of the treaty. Uh, and therefore, it does not have an immediate effect until those countries accept the idea of the treaty. But it reflects something very impatient. The rest of the world uh, is very impatient, sorry, uh, with the slow pace of disarmament and not willing to accept that they will only be bystanders and victims in case nuclear weapons are ever used. The most basic thing that I hope to hear from a new president, because under this administration today, no US official has repeated something that was so blindingly obvious to most people, but still caused a stir when Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev said it, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Simply repeating that at the presidential level would have an effect on the degree of tension and risk that we face today. So finally, what does it mean for citizens? Uh, risk and complexity are things that permeate any kind of discussion about nuclear weapons. To a great degree, experts in nuclear weapons, whether military or government leaders, have tended to minimize the risk and exaggerate the complexity of the issues. The perception of risk in most of our society and in Russian or Chinese society for that matter, does not match the reality of the risk. And at the same time, the complexity that people perceive is not so great that it ought to prevent citizens from engaging with experts and making their views known as these difficult issues are debated. So this is a little advertisement. Uh, the association that I volunteered to lead, the Arms Control Association is one of the oldest. Uh, we will celebrate our 50th anniversary next year, one of the oldest in this field. And our mission is to make sure that U.S. national security is not only strong, but has reduced risk. And we believe that we can get there by reducing reliance on nuclear weapons, even as we campaign to fight against chemical and biological weapons as well. <clears throat> so I hope you will go to our website, armscontrol.org. Uh, our <clears throat> Uh, our files, our dossier on nuclear issues uh, is unparalleled, and our magazine is fascinating. And if you're not yet convinced, let me tell you, you cannot join a more prestigious association at a lower price.
than to become a member of the Arms Control Association. So let me, uh, uh, let's leave this slide up for a couple of minutes. These are a couple of uh, resources I recommend. Our website, the Outrider website, uh, a couple of great books on this subject. Um, and I'd love to tell you more about Daniel Ellsberg's book, for example, as well as uh, a couple of longer articles on the issue of arms control that I have authored. And if we leave that up for a moment, Megan, I think I can hand it back to you to uh, moderate questions in the chat. Perfect. Yep, that sounds great. Um, so one, while we are waiting on questions, um, so you can submit your questions via the chat in Zoom. If you are watching on Facebook, you can submit them in the comments and I will monitor those as well. Um, so while you take a moment to think about questions for Tom, I want to remind you that this is our last program of this fall semester. Um, we will be taking a break for the holidays, so please keep an eye out for future emails detailing our programs in the spring. Um, so with that, um, we already have some good questions coming in, so I will, I'll just read these to you, Tom, just for the benefit of anyone calling in, and then I'll hand it back to you. So. Um, first question, can you list or speculate about the ways in which the agenda of nuclear arms control might dovetail with the agenda of combating climate change? Yeah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> that's a tough one. There's a very good article, and in fact, I think I showed that article <laughs> in my slide. Uh, that uh, by Matt Corda that explains that interconnection better than I could. Um, the, uh, and so that's Matt Corda in The Nation, October 14th, 2019. And I think he will explain it better. Uh, his main point was that nuclear weapons is a more instantaneous existential threat and less predictable than climate change. Uh, but uh, no less devastating and potentially more devastating. And the way I look at it, if climate change continues at its current pace, mankind will make sufficient adjustments that will be painful, that will cause a lot of death, that will cause a lot of economic hardship, <clears throat> but the human race will survive. An all-out nuclear war between the U.S. and the Russian Federation would put so much soot, ash, from burning cities into the atmosphere that the change in climate would be far more disastrous and long-lasting, and it is unlikely that mankind would survive as a species. Um, there's others uh, who have written, including Corda, who have written better than I can think at the moment about the interconnection of the challenges. Uh, but one of the points about it is that the United States has to be a leader in both fields. We don't have the option of saying we're only going to address nuclear risk, we're only going to address climate change if it benefits us. Uh, we are the progenitor of nuclear weapons. We are the largest possessor of nuclear weapons. Uh, we have done a lot to reduce carbon output, uh, but we have still contributed more than any other country to the level of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, so to me, the primary connection is not just about our own survival, which should be a sufficient reason for any American citizen, but I think also about the larger issue, a responsibility that we owe to the rest of the world. Okay, great. So um, next question, could you also briefly address the issue of numbers and times involved in weapons in launch on warning or hair trigger status versus others in more stable confirmation? Yeah. Um, now, it's a great question. And again, I refer you especially to the book by Bill Perry and Tom Colina, The Button, B 
because he describes this in great detail. Um, hair trigger, the US and the Russian Federation will both deny that their weapons are on hair trigger alert. Uh, both sides, for example, took a symbolic step uh, several years back of what they call detargeting or de-alerting. In other words, right now, the ICBMs that are sitting in silos in North Dakota and Minnesota and Wyoming, officially they are targeted to the most remote parts of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, however, if the president decided to launch an all-out nuclear attack on Russia, the transformation of the target information from the Pacific Ocean to downtown Moscow is virtually instantaneous. So uh, denying that we have hair trigger, uh, technically the US and Russian militaries are correct, but that is not a very comforting reality. The more difficult part is launch on warning. What this means is that the United States policy is if we have reliable indications that there is a major nuclear attack coming from Russia or less likely, well, I don't think it's very likely from either Russia or China because I don't think either of those regimes are suicidal. But the idea is <clears throat> uh, if we have reliable information that they have launched, the president would launch all of our land-based ICBMs, those 400 missiles, mostly in the Western part of the United States on Russia before a single Russian warhead has reached the US. It makes sense if your goal is to deter the other guy by scaring the hell out of him. However, there is no way that those missiles can be recalled if you learn two minutes after the launch order is given that your information was wrong, that it was a satellite error, a computer error, that it was somebody hacking your network, which is not very likely, but is not impossible. Uh, and so in that case, it is the US that has just initiated a nuclear war. Bill Perry makes a good argument in his book that ICBMs, those 400 missiles, are the most dangerous part of the entire equation. If you are not trying to protect those 400 missiles, if you don't have the imperative to use them or lose them, the president has the option in that case to wait he does not have to make a decision in less than seven minutes about whether to he's responding to or initiating a nuclear war. He has additional time to gather information because we have submarines that have as much destructive potential in those dozen submarines as all of the 400 ICBMs in the American West. Uh, so actually eliminating ICBMs, eliminating the pressure to launch on warning would, in Secretary Perry's opinion, and I agree with him, stabilize rather than destabilize the situation. Yikes, that's some scary stuff. <laughs> um, so before we go on to the next question, I do want to just mention, um, in the spirit of making this a bit more conversational, feel free to turn on your um, video feed if you'd like. Um, please keep your audio feed turned off so that we don't have background noise, but if you want to show us your face, we're fine with that. Um, so for the next question, um, so should the U.S. re-engage in a treaty such as the SCPOA with Iran, and if so, how so, and how soon? Um, well, the very short answer is yes. The uh, JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Program of Action, succeeded in its goal of closing off permanently Iran's various paths to a nuclear weapon. Yes, there were parts of the supervision mechanism of the JCPOA that would expire after 10 or 15 years, 
but the most important parts, Iran's adherence to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, its uh, respect of the additional protocol of the International Atomic Energy Agency, and the most intrusive inspection system ever for any nuclear agreement, all of those parts of the JCPOA do not expire. They do not sunset. So Iran's path to a nuclear weapon was permanently closed off uh, for reasons that include psychological as much as political. Uh, President Trump withdrew from the treaty and in the intervening time, Iran has violated several provisions of the treaty. Both President-elect Biden and the Iranian president have said they are ready to return immediately to compliance. And I hope that that's exactly what happened. Now, there are plenty of ayatollahs in Tehran who don't agree with President Rouhani and are going to make this as complex and difficult as possible. And there are plenty of ayatollahs here in Washington who don't agree with President-elect Biden and are gonna make this as complex and difficult as possible. But the right thing to do is simply to return immediately, compliance for compliance, and then to see what other difficult topics with Iran we can address together. The same thing is true of New START. <clears throat> I see a question in the chat about can President Biden simply go back and extend New START? The answer is yes. It's an unusual treaty in that the treaty negotiated in 2010 was limited to 10 years, but with a clause that said if the two presidents agree, it can be extended for an additional five years without going back either to the US Senate or the Russian Duma for re-ratification. So it literally takes just two signatures. The Trump administration tried to make it more complicated than it needed to be. They thought that if Russia really wants to extend it, then that must mean Russia wants it more than we do and we can extort some price from Russia for simply agreeing to extend a treaty that both sides are honoring and that serves both sides national security. As a consequence, I mean, the Russians quite correctly from my point of view, were not interested in playing that political game. So again, the right thing to do is for President Biden and President Putin to exchange signatures and say, there, that's done. We have this element of stability for at least five years that gives us some time to work on the next agreement that will further reduce numbers, further reduce risk. All right, perfect. Um, so another question, um, can President Biden renew New START on his own? Yeah, I think I just answered that, yes. Okay, <laughs> all right, so moving on. Um, so. Maynard Glitman, who negotiated the INF Treaty, is probably rolling over in his grave. What could or should we have done to ameliorate the situation with the Russian Federation rather than just withdraw because the Russians were cheating? Um, yeah, that's a good complex question. Um, so the INF Treaty, by the way, was not exactly a nuclear treaty. I, I'm not sure the word nuclear appears in the treaty. To go back to the history, in the late 70s and early 80s, Russia began to deploy intermediate range missiles. That is missiles with a range of between 300 to 3,000 miles in the Western Soviet Union. And so these were missiles that with nuclear warheads were not capable of hitting the US, but were capable of hitting all of the NATO territory in Europe. NATO allies understandably saw this as a threat and together with the US, first the Carter and then the Reagan administration agreed to deployment of similar US missiles in Western Europe, which of course the Russians saw as a pretty serious threat. And we got into very strong competition 
that caused a lot of division within NATO. It caused the most massive anti-nuclear protests that we've seen in history. You may remember a million people in Central Park or on Greenham Common, London in 1982. Um, but the solution was the correct one that both sides would eliminate not just nuclear missiles pointed at each other in Europe, but all missiles of that range, 500 to 5,500 kilometers. That was unprecedented to eliminate entirely from both arsenals a complete category of weapons. And it was, as I said, the most important breakthrough that Gorbachev and Reagan achieved. Um, <clears throat> over time, it became less attractive, first to the Russian military and then also to the U.S. military. To the Russian military because NATO in 1982 was conventionally inferior to Russia and the Warsaw Pact. But NATO in 2010 was in conventional terms far superior to Russian military forces. And therefore, the attraction of having not nuclear missiles, but intermediate range conventional warhead missiles became greater for the Russian military. For the US, the fact that we did not have any missiles of this range, not only in Europe, but anywhere in the US arsenal, meant that China, was building plenty of missiles of that range that would have an effect in case we ever had a conflict with China in Asia. So the value to both militaries of not having such a missile declined sharply. The Russian military, without asking the Russian foreign ministry if it was allowed under the treaty, went ahead and built a missile of exactly that range, tested it, and then denied that they had tested it. It's clearly a violation. The Obama administration and then the Trump administration tried for five years using the mechanisms in the treaty to get Russia to come back into compliance with the treaty. When they didn't, the Trump administration withdrew. I think the Trump withdrawal is justified because of the Russian violation but justified is not the same thing as smart. We withdrew from the treaty without having e an alternate plan, either on the military side or on the diplomatic side. Now, I don't think a new treaty is possible. Going back to the INF is not possible in the same way that going back to the Open Skies Treaty or going back to JCPOA with Iran is possible. But I think it is possible to get a new agreement that would attain most of the objectives of the 1987 INF Treaty. If Russia de does not deploy any of its new missiles on the Western side of Russia, then the US can avoid deploying new missiles to Europe. And since the Russian new missiles are aimed at Europe rather than at the United States, I do think this would be a good situation in which the US might want to follow the lead of our allies instead of dictating to them what the NATO approach would be. I always forget that I'm muted. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go a bit out of order um, because on a similar note, um, someone has asked, on INF, besides Russia cheating, was it not also a problem that China was not covered? Yes, and that's uh, why the U.S. military is not entirely unhappy with the demise of the INF treaty. <clears throat> it is, uh, there's no desire on the part of the U.S. military or anybody in the U.S to go and deploy nuclear armed intermediate range missiles in Asia. Uh, but the military does believe since China has been the most active developer and has the biggest arsenal of such missiles, focused 
not on launching nuclear missiles against the US, but on dominating the battle space in case of a conflict in Asia, uh, the Pentagon has felt we are at a severe disadvantage. <laughs> the uh, trick, if you wanna build a whole bunch of new intermediate range missiles that you may one day use against China, where do you put them? For understandable reasons, neither Japan nor South Korea are enthusiastic about hosting new battalions of US missiles. And that leaves you Guam, which I'm sure is a very nice place, but not a very big or very defensible place to put a whole bunch of miss missiles. Okay, um, so next question. With all the concern regarding Iran obtaining nuclear weapons, why are the 200 nuclear weapons of Israel rarely ever mentioned? Would not a proposal for a nuclear-free Middle East be a worthwhile approach for convincing the Iranians to give up their desire to develop nuclear weapons? Uh, it's a great question. We could take another hour on that. Um, first of all, if I were still a US government official, uh, I would answer that question by changing the subject. Uh, we were not allowed to discuss or entertain the thought of whether or not Israel possessed nuclear weapons. Uh, I am not revealing any classified information when I say Israel does possess nuclear weapons. I don't know how many, uh, but uh, they are an issue in the Middle East. And in fact, it's an issue on which I spent a ridiculous, literally ridiculous amount of time in my five years as assistant secretary. Uh, in 2010, the US, Russia, and the United Kingdom accepted an assignment to try to begin a process to hold a conference at which the states of the Middle East could begin to discuss how do we go about creating a nuclear free zone in the Middle East. Uh, and I had the point for the US government on that discussion with the Arabs and Israelis and rarely with the Iranians uh, and uh, other diplomats like Ron McMullen would recognize that the problem is in getting the agenda for the first meeting. If both sides have such different perspectives on the topic, each believes that if you accept the other side's proposal for the agenda of the first meeting, that's going to determine everything else that happens over the next 10 years of negotiation. So we never got the first meeting. We couldn't agree on a four sentence agenda. Um, there's a lot of reasons why creating a nuclear free zone in the Middle East is a hundred times harder than the successful efforts to create a nuclear free zone in Latin America or Africa or Southeast Asia. Um, it is correct <clears throat> that Israel's possession of nuclear weapons is one of the incentives for Iran to maintain a level of nuclear development where future development of a weapon could be an option. Iran actively pursued a weapon until 2003. It is the judgment of all US intelligence analysts that it has not pursued a weapon since 2003, but it likes to keep its centrifuges. Uh, and that's why the agreement, the JCPOA that limited the number of centrifuges limited the numbers and types of enriched uranium that Iran could hold was so important in making sure they could never move quickly towards a nuclear weapon. Uh, it is, of course, not only Israel's program that concerns Iran. It is the nonstop state of hostility between Iran and the United States for 42 years. Uh, that motivates them to keep, uh, what's the right word, uh, to keep an ace up their sleeve in terms of a nuclear program that is not immediately dangerous, 
but which the world cannot ignore. How you ever convince Israel that it is now safe for them to give up nuclear weapons, uh, that's a different question for which I don't have an answer. Okay, um, so I think we'll do one more question. So um, given this um, anxious map of possibilities, what is the potentially hopeful but seemingly paradoxical relation between the likelihood of more nation states developing nuclear weapons and avoiding any or all forms of nuclear arms use? And that is to say nothing of non-state actors. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, a couple of thoughts. Um, first, one of the important things that President Obama said in that speech in Prague in 2009 was that the risk of nuclear conflict between the US and Russia was at one of its lowest points historically, but that a different kind of risk was at a higher point. And that difference was the risk that a non-state organization, that is a terrorist organization, might be able to acquire a nuclear explosive device. Uh, and in order to push back against that risk, he initiated a series of what were called nuclear security summits. <clears throat> it, uh, the hard part in building a nuclear weapon is getting your hands on fissile material that is either highly enriched uranium or plutonium. Those are not easy to come by. But in fact, there was a lot of both categories of fissile material lying around in the world, whether in research reactors in places like Serbia or Mexico or the Philippines, uh, or whether it was in the uh, dismantling facilities of the United States or India or Pakistan or especially Russia where a very determined risk-taking terrorist might be able to get together a little at a time or all at once a significant quantity of uranium or plutonium. And so in <clears throat> three summit meetings, each of them involving 40 presidents and prime ministers, uh, the world took action and has made enormous progress in making it more difficult than it was 10 years ago for any terrorist to get their hands on such material. It is not a risk you can ever totally ignore, but it is a uh, risk that I believe is much lower than it was 10 years ago. <coughs> the other question, are there states that don't currently have nuclear weapons that will be tempted to acquire them? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. The usual suspects are South Korea, which is understandable because they have a neighbor with nuclear weapons uh, that has repeatedly threatened and taken action against South Korea. In fact, South Korea is the only non-nuclear weapon state in the world in which, according to opinion surveys, a majority of the population favors building nuclear weapons. So yeah, we have to watch that. And it's a reason why maintaining a strong alliance with South Korea in meeting the North Korean challenge is so important. We really do not want South Korea to go off on its own on a nuclear weapons program. Saudi Arabia talks big because Iran talks big and they are locked in a competition of ideology and prestige in the Middle East. Uh, Saudi Arabia is another country that I would trust even less than many of the current nuclear weapon states if they had possession of a nuclear weapon. Uh, there's others you have to worry about, Turkey, Egypt, that have ambitions or aspirations. Uh, but no current capability. There's others that have immediate capability and resources, Japan or Germany, but that I'm not worried about. Uh, so all of those things you need to keep an eye on. And perhaps the most important factor in all of these <clears throat> is that uh, 
Well, let me put it this way. For the last few decades of the 20th century, the nuclear states, the five main ones, US, Russia, France, Britain, China, less and less often, they spoke about their nuclear weapons as a source of pride, as what made their country great. I mean, that's what North Korea does. That's what Pakistan does. We are a mighty country because we have nuclear weapons. Most presidents and prime ministers gave up that kind of rhetoric. It was brought back first by Mr. Putin and then by Mr. Trump and to a certain extent by Mr. Xi in China. Uh, and rhetoric really matters to the extent that the current possessors of nuclear weapons repeatedly send the signal that we are great because we have nuclear weapons, it increases the incentive of countries that wish to be near great or great to pursue nuclear weapons. I don't think the chance of any of them succeeding in the near term is very high, but it is a matter that we have to keep a close eye on. Okay. Well, with that, we will conclude our program. Um, of course, I want to give a thank you again to our sponsors, members, and volunteers for making these programs possible. Um, I also especially thank um, the Iowa Physicians for Social Responsibility who co-sponsored this particular program. And of course, Tom, thank you very much for this informative program and some great question and answers. Um, we appreciate that very much. And as a token of our appreciation, we would like to virtually present you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations mug, which will be mailed to you. <laughs> um, so with that, thank you everyone for joining us and have a safe and happy holidays. Thank you for some great questions. And when we're all traveling again, <clears throat> I'm gonna come to Iowa to see Ron. We'd love to have you again. <laughs> all right, thank goodbye you. everyone.